a short question about the future, because uh, perhaps you also mentioned the topic of the reorientation of, of the energy uh, demand, particularly with the increasing role of China. How about India? Uh, we have noticed that over the last few months, India is increasingly playing a quite, quite a strong role on the demand side of the equation. And perhaps even uh, uh, considering some sort of role of um, um, transposing the, the pressure of uh, China or the expectations that the West had about China into, into India, which is a country that is, is growing rapidly. I mean, the Indian economy just during the last year grew up to 7%. And is a, the, the population is also growing rapidly. So there is also a huge demographic pressure taking place. How do you think this will reshape uh, the, the the future of, of the supply and demand uh, side uh, on, on energy in the future? Yeah, no, those are that's a great question. And I think this is a reflection of the non-OECD world and the growing demand uh, from developing economies as well. I mean, you know, GDP and energy demand are no longer directly correlated, but that doesn't mean that they aren't correlated at all, right? They don't directly parallel each other. Um, uh, economic growth can happen at a rate that allows for uh, less energy intensity, in, intensity uh, but it nonetheless, uh, aggregate population growth, when you're adding billions of people over the next decades uh, to the global economy, especially in regions like India and South Asia, especially in regions like Africa, uh, it's going to necessitate uh, energy demand, and it's going to, uh, you know, be predicated on, on growing uh, need and call on resources. Now, I would argue that India has uh, given its its uh, own energy mix domestically and the lack of indigenous fossil energy resources has an incentive uh, very similar to China to find other supply chains that allow them to capitalize on increasingly uh, cost-effective renewable energy technologies and other energy technologies that don't draw on the need for fossil energy as much. But as I, as I think I outlined and, and certainly redid, you know, that doesn't account for hard to debate sectors. So as these populations and economies grow and you have industrial needs and you have aviation and, uh, and transportation sectors that are still gonna draw on fossil energy resources, uh, most certainly uh, this is gonna have a bearing in terms of the demand from those countries. I don't see that, however, uh, having a bearing on uh, the US Middle East relationship uh, in particular, I think that the the, you know, it'll be an economic competitiveness aspect. Uh, you have to respect the proximity that the Middle East has to that market. Uh, they're going to be uh, very, a lot of cost effective and economic solutions to provide uh, to the South Asia region. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the relationship with uh, India in terms of uh, broader environmental policy, climate policy, uh, economic policy is much more closely tied uh, to the West uh, maybe maybe slightly more independent in the same way the Middle East is, um, but it's certainly closer to uh, to the diplomatic circles that we have here than than China would be, right? Which is which is at this point uh, fairly adversarial, and that that lends itself to uh, to finding I think more opportunity uh, as those markets grow uh, than than you would see in the the U.S. China relationship, for example. And there is this impression. Uh, that uh, sometimes the, the the pressure for a country to initiate policies for transition may somehow affect their own competitiveness. And I wonder if, uh, considering the current situation on on the on the supply and demand side of the equation, do you think that this may lead some sort of rule uh, in the upcoming political relations between the West and the MENA region in order to, to work together? Uh, what, what will be those paths through which we can work in order to find common ground uh, on, on, on this discussion? Well, let me be a little bit more blunt on this one. It absolutely weighs on, uh, on economic decisions. You know, you've watched uh, Europe, in particular, in the face of this crisis in, in Ukraine and Russia's, you know, invasion of Ukraine, uh, you've watched the reorientation of, of fossil fuel subsidies and, and uh, protectionist policies meant to bolster the economies 
um, of each of these countries in Europe. And I get it because they're they're fearful of uh, deindustrialization and the consequences of, uh, of turning away from Russia's energy supply as they try to avoid funding uh, this unjust invasion uh, of, of Ukraine. And so I think that you, it's absolutely a fact that this happens. So to turn to your question about, is this actually a space for opportunity and collaboration? Absolutely. And uh, let me just give one example. The US and the UAE entered into the Partnership for Accelerating Clean Energy. It's called PACE. It's a hundred billion dollar uh, uh, commitment over the next, uh, a little over a decade. A uh, hundred billion dollars to put out a hundred gigawatts of clean energy, and you know whether or not we're talking about fossil energy or energy in general, I think that the fact is there's plenty of room to collaborate. Uh, we think of the Middle East region as a, a massive fossil energy uh, focused uh, space, but it is amazing uh, solar and certainly some pretty decent wind resources as well. And so I think. You know, the policies that you're going to hear from Washington are going to encourage us to be all of the above. Let's pursue our clean energy ambitions as quickly as we are ensuring our energy security ambitions and making sure there's supply of, uh, of adequate amounts of fossil energy and oil and gas uh, in the interim until we achieve our net zero ambitions. And, and perhaps there's quite a bit of space for fossil, depending on how much investment goes into CCS, uh, you know, direct air capture technologies, things are on the vanguard, uh, but we're working on developing pretty aggressively. So, no, I think that, you know, when you hear about agreements like that, it shows demonstrably uh, that the PACE initiative is an example that there are plenty of opportunities for collaboration, uh, you know, across the board when it comes to energy access and ensuring uh, both the developing world, but the world in general has better uh, energy security because, you know, energy security is economic security, is national security, and you can't take the policy actions required to have a smooth transition, a just equitable transition to net zero uh, emissions without stable political environments. And those, cause this requires hard, big, large uh, concept uh, policies to take root. And so, so that would be my, my argument is that we have uh, a plenty of space to collaborate between the Middle East and, and uh, the United States. And I, I want also to, to open the, the floor to both of you, gentlemen, if you mind, with the following question as well. There is this increasing uh, global geoeconomic competition uh, for finding um, cheap fossil fuels everywhere, uh, as we have been discussing all over this session, China, India, Southeast Asia. Uh, Many countries are, are are trying to find their way in the middle of uh, a, a highly uh, volatile uh, political uh, year, so to speak. So, how how what do you think will be uh, your your advice uh, for the for the Mina region in in order uh, to uh, to to find the best way to to create a strategic. Uh, a relationship with different regions and what what will be the benefit of the MENA region precisely to to open up those bridges those channels uh, uh, with uh, corporations with companies uh, from from Europe uh, and uh, from the Western Journal the United States and others instead of perhaps changing uh, the the dynamic of uh, of supply to other regions all over the planet what what do you think are, will be the advantages for the MENA region uh, to to find these sort of uh, partnerships uh, with, with with the West in particularly when it comes to energy supply in comparison with many other competitors currently in the global geoeconomic landscape. Sure, I, you know there aren't too many uh, pioneering uh, countries in terms of entering the global energy market and oil and gas right now. Um, a lot of I think the supply is anchored. Uh, for for you know in in existing plays and so for every Ghana you're looking at you know uh, additional U.S. production you're looking at uh, expansions within the UAE Saudi Arabia and the Kingdom and and so I think that there's you're not wrong to say that there isn't a desire to look for opportunities uh, around the world but I think the biggest area where collaboration can happen uh, is uh, is is on helping maybe less mature. Um, national oil companies, and I, by maturity, I mean, you know, just the capacity, maybe increase the capacity of some of these national oil companies. I won't name any by, uh, by name, but I think uh, 
you know, there are countries that have, for example, fairly egregious methane management or flaring challenges. Uh, and, and, you know, to the degree that the U.S. and, and uh, the, the Middle East as a whole have an interest in seeing any enduring future for fossil energy, uh, we can't let these, uh, these uh, you know, wasteful practices to continue and sustain. And I think you'd find a lot of support uh, both in Europe and, and the United States from, uh, from policies that help national oil companies uh, bring to bear uh, better policies and deploy capital uh, to account for those kind of those kind of wasteful practices. Um, that's also going to bring on more supply, right? So it kind of makes uh, uh, less room for for uh, exploration and new plays and and more of a focus on existing supply and expansion on, on I think uh, areas that are known. Um, but you are seeing you are seeing as as Europe turns away from. Uh, from Russian supply, uh, a bigger focus again in North Africa, and uh, and to the degree that we can help ensure that those are the cleanest barrels as well, uh, there'd be a lot of goodwill built uh, between the, between the two regions. Reid, yeah, I, I would echo what you said and, and perhaps summarize slightly by by saying I think the opportunity for the MENA region at large is is making sure that you know its role as a supply. Uh, as a as a major source of supply isn't only in the in the in the mo molecular context, right? It's not just it's not just producing. Um, it's leveraging its uh, its own human capital and its own production expertise uh, to support the development of uh, low carbon industries in those consuming nations as they look to uh, you know use hydrocarbons for their secure baseload. So I think to Landon's point. It's partially, you know, leveraging the expertise and, and leadership present in the region uh, to support, you know, national oil companies around the world to better develop their own resources, but also where the MENA region is tapping into and supporting consuming markets, right? Making sure that we're actually are taking a, a, a full value approach to the to the hydrocarbon supply chain, such that in addition to just supplying the molecule, you're supplying the molecule that was produced in a in a low carbon way. But also the molecule is then being supplied and actually used uh, in a low carbon manner by by supporting the development of CCUS projects in the downstream, et cetera. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, considering the our limitations of, of time, I would like to close this session with asking the following question. What will be the advice for uh, making sure that all parts are able to sit on the table on the COP28 event to take place this year and be part of a serious discussion about uh, the global transition uh, uh, to match uh, different goals on sustainability, security, and uh, affordability. What uh, will be the, uh, the main argument uh, in order to sit everyone on the table? I might jump in first just to, to note that, you know, having the COP at, at Expo City uh, as a massive venue to have the, the COP is the first great step in bringing all those, making sure all those places have a, all those voices, all those perspectives have a place to sit. Um, but I think importantly, um, you know, to the extent to which the, the UAE as host of the COP uh, can uh, clarify well in the lead up to, uh, to November, December, exactly what you know, what those deliverables are going to look like for the, what those expectations for the oil and gas industry are really going to be, uh, that's going to have add momentum to the conversation around financing, sustainable economic and energy development in the developing world. It's gonna add momentum to the conversation around the contributions that the oil and gas uh, industry should be making, um, you know, as, as COP outcomes. Um, and also is going to empower, again, a lot of this conversation around how you facilitate the developing world's, uh, you know, uh, equity uh, in the climate conversation is empowering those voices to come to the table in the first place and feel that their conversation, that their their needs around energy access and sustainable economic development are going to be heard and accepted um, by a range of parties. And I think those three pieces are important to making that happen. Dr. Castaneda, I really appreciate this question as a closer because I I, well, you know, uh, when Reed was talking about this earlier in the first half of the, of the conversation, really wanted to jump in then. Um, I, I, you cannot understate the importance of this COP 
uh, I think, to a broad slate of, of uh, interests in the Middle East. I think that there's a question here, not just of, of economic policy and fossil energy, uh, but geopolitical legitimacy. And, and so I think the outcomes are going to be a very uh, big global litmus uh, test for, for the ability of the region to uh, more actively continue to play a role in global diplomacy uh, across the board. Uh, but as it comes to COP28 in particular, uh, and if we really are you know, going to have an opportunity where for the first time uh, in 28 COPs, a CEO is the actual leader of the conversation, the head of the national oil company, but also the, the chairman uh, and founder of the renewable energy company in the region. Uh, uh, there's nobody that has, I think, a, a more comprehensive command of the energy sector uh, that's been in one of, one of these positions. The question is, how do you turn that into legitimizing this as a long-term solution for the cops? We've had uh, you know, decades of diplomacy and they've led to some pretty transformational outcomes, including the Paris Agreement at COP23. Uh, and, and I think you know, now the question is, can we turn that into action? Uh, the audience here isn't, you know, the segment of, of the activist community or the environmental community that perhaps aren't going to be persuaded about the value of oil and gas showing up, but it's going to be a lot more than I think what oil and gas has historically done. And, uh, and so if you want to see industry continue to be a valuable and uh, reasonable part of this dialogue globally, I think we really have to see uh, 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 massive actionable outcomes, including, uh, you know, actual deployment of, of, uh, renewable energy technology, actual deployment of carbon capture technology, um, actual responsibility for methane management, uh, a measurement and verification of, of emissions that are being uh, you know, put into the atmosphere. Um, and I think we have to see uh, the financing to come behind that as well. Uh, we had a chance to talk a little bit about capacity building uh, in third party countries. Not everybody's at the same position. Uh, to achieve these uh, these benchmarks, I think the Western world and the Middle East, uh, at least the, the, the Arab Peninsula, um, are absolutely in a position to show leadership in these uh, these uh, these areas, and they should be transferring that kind of knowledge and capacity building to other parts of the of the world as well. So, um, just uh, absolute uh, underscore and exclamation mark behind the importance of this COP, uh, and uh, encourage. Uh, not only waiting for benchmarks from the UAE in terms of what uh, uh, what action uh, it means, but also companies coming forward and saying, you know what, we have proactive steps and here's how we think we can do it and having those conversations with a very receptive uh, COP28 team today. Um, how, how do you think uh, if, if this is successful that will accelerate the, the need for renewables, specifically renewable commodities? such as uh, copper in Chile or lithium in Australia, do you think what, what will be the direction of, of, of this debate? Because we are passing from transition clean energies and perhaps to an increasing demand for renewables. Do you think this will somehow affect the, the discussion or? We, so Reed's a real expert here, but what I'll tell you is, uh, is the, you know, we talked about population growth and, and broader geographic uh, changes, uh, uh, demographic changes uh, global in the you know South Asia, Africa, elsewhere. Uh, there's going to be a demand for all energy resources aggressively, and that exists today as well. I think uh, the call on these resources can only expand uh, more aggressively, and, and I think that that's where I'll turn to read in a second here to speak to it. But the fact is, uh, we need investment across the board to meet the energy uh, demand needs of the world. And, uh, and you know, uh, there shouldn't be any hesitancy. I don't think that these policies are necessarily in conflict as much as they're, uh, they're mutually reinforcing the fact that uh, global energy access, uh, whether it's through electrons created through a solar panel um, or combustion from a gas turbine um, are, are gonna be helping us have political and economic stability that enable us to achieve our, our net zero ambition, uh, ambitions. Yeah, it, it's uh, you could have an hour long conversation just devoted to to this piece as as well. It's the reality is uh, in all of the above energy transition that that Landon alluded to here, right? One which has sufficient security of supply in the hydrocarbon space, but also effectively 
um, supports the deployment of renewable and clean energy technologies is a much more resource intensive world um, and a resource intensive world, which not just in, you know, is resource intensive in, in oil and gas, but resource intensive um, in the traditional commodities that have powered economic growth, steel, copper, aluminum, et cetera, um, but also the new materials and minerals that are going to underpin those renewable energy technologies in particular, those being lithium, cobalt, rare earth elements, uh, you know, the, and I think, you know, one last note here, I think the, the reality that so many energy consuming nations are now pivoting to thinking about their renewable energy resources um, as critical minerals, right? Developing these these almost geostrategic lists of the things that they're, they, they know they're, are directly tied to energy security and economic competitiveness out to 2050 and beyond um, is emblematic of where that's going to, those commodities and mineral resources are going to be an, an additional source of stress and possibly inflation in the energy system. But also, um, you know, when you look to the, the where those minerals and supply chains are concentrated, uh, possibly a source of additional geopolitical tension. Uh, moving into the future. Thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of the Center for the Study of the Global Economic Future, I, I, I want to thank you both of you gentlemen, uh, Mr. Landon Durant, Mr. Reed uh, Blakemore, for sharing uh, with us uh, today your insights on this very important topic. Uh, I want uh, to give the floor to Mr. Mahmoud Sharif, Managing Director for the Center of the Global Economic Future, uh, to close this session with a few remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Reli uh, Katarida, for your uh, wonderful moderation. I would like to thank uh, uh, Mr. Reed Blackmore for his uh, uh, insightful and thoughtful and uh, analytical and strategic uh, uh, read of the of the of the of the oil and, uh, and uh, fossil fuels and, and, uh, and renewables market, uh, uh, and also his his geopolitical analysis and the uh, and understanding of the geopolitical implications. I'd like really to thank you, uh, Mr. Reid, for you for you uh, tonight and for your uh, thoughtful mm -hmm. ideas. Also, I would like to to thank uh, Mr. London for his uh, uh, for shedding light on the economics of uh, of uh, energy and uh, explaining to us how the, the actual the markets and the the, the political uh, forces uh, uh, are intertwined in this uh, uh, in this uh, industry and within this topic. Really, really, I'm I'm very glad to have you tonight. Uh, uh, we learned a lot, and you have uh, enlightened us. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you. It's Thank been you a very pleasure. Much. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.